Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Air China Space Updates. I'm Sean Deville, joined as always by Blaine Curcio. In this episode, we discuss satellite connectivity for airlines in China. But first, let's deep dive into the Wentian experimental module of the Chinese space station. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So recently, we saw the CMSA, the Chinese Manned Space Agency, release publicly the first picture ever of Wentian, which is one of the two experimental modules of the Chinese space station and scheduled for launch this summer. And while there's no real scoop around this picture, it's still a very impressive one with lots of details visible. And this gives us a good opportunity to just deep dive into what Wentian is all about. So firstly, as a brief recap for those who aren't very familiar with the Chinese space station or the CSS, the CSS is composed of three modules. You have the Tianhe one core module, which is already in orbit and that serves as the main headquarters for the Taikonauts and also as the control center of the entire space station. And next, you have Mengtian and Wentian, which are experimental modules, meaning that they're dedicated specifically to space sciences. But beyond space sciences, they do have a couple more tricks up their sleeves. So let's look at Wentian visually. At a very high level, it looks very similar to Tianhe One. You have similar lengths, I believe 17.9 for Wentian versus 16.6 for Tianhe. They also have similar diameters and their structure looks very much alike. You have a massive cylindrical cabin that's then followed by two modules with a smaller diameter. I believe for Wentian, it's the working airlock and the control modules respectively. Now, despite the apparent similarities, there are actually quite a few differences and let's get into that now. So let's go into propulsion first. Similar to Tianhe One, Wentian has a number of thrusters for attitude control, but rather than having them all around the propulsion unit, as it's the case for the Tianhe One, on Wentian they are spread out between the larger and smaller cylindrical modules. And according to various Chinese space media, this is because the accuracy of attitude control is more critical with Wentian because Wentian will have to dock with Tianhe, and this is why. Spreading out the thrusters at both ends of Wentian is beneficial in this regard. Now, there's also a second difference: Hall effect thrusters. The Tianhe One module is equipped with four Hall effect thrusters for orbital control, but these are nowhere to be seen on the picture that was provided by CMSA of Wentian. So we don't exactly know where they went, but maybe there is no Hall effect thrusters because Wentian will not be performing orbital control maneuvers once it's docked to Tianhe. All of that will be performed by Tianhe. And finally, there are six control moment gyros on the Tianhe One core module. It's these six、um, odd-looking white balls that you can see that are visible from the outside of Tianhe One, but they seem to be absent from One Tian. And from other Chinese sources, we know that these CMGs, these control moment gyros, are actually there on One Tian. It's just that for One Tian, they are internal rather than being on the outside. And trying to explain that a bit. Putting CMGs on the outside does help with noise because CMGs are basically fast spinning discs. But this was probably deemed unnecessary for One Tian due to the fact that the Taikonauts wouldn't be spending that much time in One Tian anyway. One Tian is for experiments. It's also a temporary living quarters, but again, it's it's temporary only. And speaking of living quarters, let's get into a little bit more detail. So there are three sleeping areas in the Tianhe One core module, but One Tian will extend that capability to six by providing three additional sleeping spaces, and this will enable a team of three Taikonauts to be continuously on the Chinese space station. Just to explain that a little bit, a relieving team of Shenzhou Taikonauts would be able to arrive at the Chinese space station while the previous team of three Taikonauts are still there and are still using the three sleeping quarters that are in the Tianhe core module. Next, let's talk about solar arrays. Wen Tian, as well as Men Tian, will have massive solar arrays, and they will become the main energy source of the Chinese space station once they are deployed, because they're much larger than the current ones that you have on Tianhe One. I wasn't really able to find the exact length of the Wen Tian solar arrays, but you know, knowing that the Tianhe One arrays are 12.6 meters long, and you know, using an isometric view of the Chinese space station that I found, we can use Photoshop and sort of measure and estimate the total length of these arrays by comparison. And after playing around with that, these massive solar arrays on Meng Tian and Wen Tian are roughly 40 meters long, give or take, so significantly longer than the ones on the Tianhe One. 
And also another very interesting fact on Mengtian and Wentian solar arrays, once they're in place and deployed, they'll be blocking some sunlight for the smaller Tianhe-1 solar arrays, meaning that the Tianhe-1 solar arrays naturally will lose some output in terms of power. And to solve this problem, what the Chinese did was that um, the solar arrays of Tianhe-1 were made detachable, meaning that the robotic arm of the Chinese space station will be able to displace and deploy these smaller solar arrays to each end of the experimental modules where they wouldn't be affected by any occultation phenomenon. And you can see this on the image here. And speaking of robotic arms, while the Tianhe one core module already has one very large 10 meter long robotic manipulator, Wentian actually has the specificity of having its own smaller five meter long robotic arm. And this arm can be combined with the main robotic arm to form this massive 15 meter long robotic arm, which can basically reach anywhere of the future completed Chinese space station. And this is not just due to its length, but it's also due to its ability to crawl using the various arm attachments that um, the Chinese have put all around the Chinese space station. And finally, one of the main roles of the Wentian small robotic arm will be to handle experiments in the external experimental bay. So experiments can be brought there either by Taikonauts when they are performing EVAs, extravehicular activities, also known as spacewalks, or the experiments can be brought there by the robotic arm, which is able to carry payloads up to three tons. And as you'd expect of an experimental module, Wentian will be absolutely chock full of experiments. There will be an external bay as mentioned, and this will have 24 external payload adapters. And this bay here is really helpful for experiments which are aiming at being exposed to the space environment. And this can be, for example, to extreme temperatures, can be to the vacuum of space or to solar radiation. And the payload adapters that are on this external bay come in different shapes and sizes. And not only do they enable experiments to be firmly fixed to the station, but they also have the role of providing thermal control, power, and data transmissions to the experiments themselves. And there are also multiple racks that are available inside the Wentian experimental module. So this enables experiments to take place in more, um, let's say, normal pressurized conditions inside. And to wrap up this Wentian deep dive, I just want to add some additional nuggets that are worth mentioning based on the image that we have once again from CMSA. So we can see a comms antenna that will communicate with the Tianlian relay satellites. And this antenna actually complements the antenna that already exists on the Tianhe-1. The unfortunate part about the Tianhe-1 antenna is that it's occasionally occulted by the Tianhe-1 itself. Basically, the Tianhe-1 core module masks the direct line of sight between the antenna and the relay satellite. And this happens about 10% of the time, meaning that there is no continuous communication today between the core module and the you know, ground control in China. And so this is where um, the Wentian antenna has a role to play. By complementing the Tianhe antenna, the Chinese space station will be able to have 100% continuous communication, in theory, with ground control. And finally, on Wentian, there's also an additional airlock, which will enable Taikonauts to perform EVAs or spacewalks from Wentian instead of from the current airlock of the multi-docking nod. And this airlock in Wentian will become actually the main airlock of the Chinese space station. It will replace the one in the multi-docking nod, which will only act as a backup. And one of the main advantages of this is that during an EVA, only the Wentian airlock module would be sealed, and this would enable Taikonauts that are not directly involved in the EVA to circulate between the other modules, you know, going from Tianhe to Shenzhou to Tianzhou to Mengtian without any problems. On the other hand, if the Taikonauts are using the multi-docking nod airlock, well, basically you're sealing the multi-docking nod and Taikonauts are basically trapped in the module that they are in, you know, Mengtian, Shenzhou, Tianzhou, and Tianhe, uh, you name it. So anyway, for any further information on the Chinese space station and how it moves around and what are the different components, do check out some of our dedicated videos on the subject. We actually are starting to have quite a few of them. And uh, yeah, that's it for me for Wentian. Blaine, any thoughts on Wentian or shall we move to a totally different topic, satellite connectivity for commercial airliners in China? Thanks, John. Definitely some impressive sleuthing to have come up with the approximately 40 meter size of those solar arrays that are going up there on Wentian. That's going to be impressive to watch. And just a couple of last points on the space station. I think it's an interesting point you bring up about the second airlock allowing the rest of the space station to be utilized more efficiently. I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch during the EVAs. And just the last point, a reminder, if you have not done so already, we have an article over at dongfanghour.com about the Chinese space station and its upcoming activities in 2022. So encourage you to go check that out if you'd like to learn more about the Chinese space station and what's going on there over the next year or so.
So getting into our second piece of news of the week, we have a couple of updates from China's in-flight connectivity or IFC sector. So the first update, we saw the Chinese women's national football team, or, or soccer as it were, won the AFC Women's Asian Cup in Mumbai. And during their return flight from Mumbai to Shanghai, which was on China Eastern Airlines, a Boeing 777 wide-body aircraft, they conducted a live interview, which was then broadcast on CCTV live you know, during the flight. And they were connected using satellite, and specifically the AppStar 6D KU band high throughput satellite. And so just a couple of points to unpack about this interview and China Eastern Airlines plans for IFC more generally. The first noteworthy piece of information is that the airplane achieved a speed of 220 megabits per second. And China Eastern Airlines noted that this is a roughly eight times increase over the last eight years in terms of the amount of bandwidth available per airplane. So really impressive increase in the amount of bandwidth available. And indeed, you know, 220 megabits per second, even if you have you know, 100 people on the airplane using uh, connectivity, that's a pretty decent bandwidth per person uh, for being 35,000 feet up in the air. And the second point is that China Eastern uh, noted during the article that they have plans to outfit their entire fleet with in-flight connectivity, including their narrow body air aircraft by around 2030. And this would be pretty unprecedented for any Chinese airline, in particular on the narrow body side, uh, because really up until now, we've seen a very slow, uh, in some cases indeed surprisingly slow, development of the IFC sector in China. And so just to dig a little bit more into why that is, there's definitely a few different factors. So first, we have what has been an initially very slow approval process by the Chinese government. So it's easy to forget that up until, I don't know, a handful of years ago, let's say six years ago or so, um, you could not even turn on your cell phone in flights in China. We've also seen in China over the last decade or so very conservative airlines. And this is, you know, these are big state-owned companies that are, um, you know, going to have an oligopoly in the market no matter what they do and, and no matter how little or how much they innovate. And so you can understand why they are quite conservative to make the high upfront costs to outfit IFC systems in their aircraft. Um, the other factor in the slow adoption of IFC among Chinese airlines has been a relative lack of, of satellite capacity. So I mean, up until the last uh, five years or so, we've really only had traditional wide beam satellites covering China. And that has made it very difficult for airplanes to have sufficient uh, bandwidth per airplane to justify doing IFC. And over the last couple of years, this has started to change. Initially, we saw ChinaSat 16 launched in 2017, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and then AppStar 6D, which was launched again last year, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and these satellites have brought significantly more capacity. And so the timing of the interview with the Chinese women's national soccer team was pretty interesting in the sense that this week, we also saw a research paper written by the CCID, which is a think tank under China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technologies, Electronic Information Research Institute. And this paper called for some reforms in China's in-flight connectivity industry. And so a couple of pain points points that the paper noted that were fairly similar to some of the points I've mentioned earlier, there is high cost. So this includes the very high cost of satellite capacity in China, as well as related equipment and basically everything else within the IFC ecosystem. These are all relatively costly in China, usually either due to the fact that they're being imported from uh, from other country suppliers or because they are in relatively early stages of industrial development in China itself. The paper also highlights costs associated with licenses and regulations and recommends adding more satellites and more air to ground capacity to allow for a lowering of cost for in-flight connectivity to airplanes. The second point that the paper highlights are the, in, the sort of industrial structure and the players that are involved. So the paper notes that there needs to be more integration between the IFC ecosystem and kind of the broader tech ecosystem. And the phrase, you know, platform business model gets thrown around a few times. And it's not necessarily explicitly mentioned in the paper, but my feeling is that there's this kind of... Um, endorsement of having large tech companies, so notably like Tencent or Alibaba, coming into the sector and potentially subsidizing IFC connectivity in order to allow users to use their platforms while they're in flight. And finally, the paper notes the, the need for an improvement in the variety of IFC business models. And so basically this refers to the, you know, they, they refer to the idea of having free connectivity if you're a business class passenger or if you're an economy, you can have say a slower connection and with advertisements for free, or you can pay for kind of a VIP connection with no ads and faster connectivity. So basically this kind of splintering of the market into different products and segments and offering consumers kind of more choice for what they're going to have on their in-flight connectivity service. And so overall, you know, what do we take away from this? So I think first, it's important to know the IFC penetration rate in China remains very low. So you're looking at 
you know, under 10% of airplanes having in-flight internet compared to more than 50% in North America. And so I think what we're going to see is increase in satellite capacity, and that's going to allow for better services in these specific verticals. Uh, and finally, I think, you know, Chinese consumers, similar to those in the West, they're increasingly expecting to be connected all the time, whether they're on an airplane or on a boat or, or you know, in the middle of nowhere. And so, again, I think that this is a, a tailwind for in-flight connectivity in China. And so I think you know, moving forward, there's going to be a lot of growth in this sector, but they're going to need more capacity. And if we look at the case of North America, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at well over 50% of aircraft outfitted with IFC. This really only began to happen once we started to get a lot of KA band capacity coming into the North American markets, so and notably on, on satellites like Viasat 1, Viasat 2, and also some of the Hughes satellites. And so again, looking at China, until we get significantly more satellite capacity, it's going to be very hard for airlines to offer compelling services to their customers. And it's going to be very hard for them to convince, uh, let's say, big tech companies to subsidize these services. And again, if we take an example from North America, in 2019, we saw American airlines start to offer free Apple Music trials to their, um, to their passengers. And so this would obviously require internet connectivity, you're downloading and you're streaming music. And the reason they were able to start offering this is because Apple actually started to subsidize the trials. And the reason that Apple started to subsidize the trials is because finally there was enough connectivity to the airplane, high enough bandwidth rate, to where people's experience with a free trial of Apple Music would be good enough to justify subsidizing. So we can imagine if the airplane has very limited bandwidth speed, and if you're trying to trial Apple Music and it keeps buffering and it keeps failing, you're never going to subscribe to Apple Music, and so Apple has no reason to subsidize this service. But if you have a situation where you have two megabits per second and it's a consistent uh, link, you can have a pretty good experience with Apple Music and you are a captive audience. I mean, the Apple has you there with, with only Apple Music if they want. So that being the case, I think that China is getting pretty close to what we could call a virtuous cycle for IFC. As I mentioned earlier, China Satcom and APT Satellite or APT Mobile Satcom Shenzhen, uh, they have plans for more satellites to be launched over the next couple of years. So, I mean, I think overall, if we look at North America as an example, there's definitely potential for very fast ramp up of in-flight connectivity in China over the next few years. And um, that being the case, um, again, a congratulations to the Steel Roses. That's, uh, that's an impressive win. And Jean, anything from your side on IFC or women's football or uh, or, or anything along those lines? Or are we uh, all good for the week? So nothing else on my side on Chinese IFC. Before we wrap up, I just want to say a special thanks to our most recent patron, Chuvi Kwan, who went to buy us some coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash hour. And also, I want to say a special thanks to Ed Five, who sent us this amazing Happy New Year card that's space themed. You get a lot of cool stuff like you have spacecraft from both the US and the Chinese space exploration uh, programs, also Russia as well. So really cool stuff. Thank you very much. And this is probably the first time that Dongfang Hour is getting some fan mail. So that's very cool. More seriously, do check out Ed Five's work at ed5design.com. There's some very good stuff there. And apart from that, as usual, a special shout out to our good friends at GoTikonauts and SpaceWatch.Global, two great sources of space industry news. And with that, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week.